snow in Dublin in March is about as popular as the meal I'm about to eat. Every Saturday in the Temple Bar food market, Pat Highland serves up a highly controversial dish. Very healthy. It's uh, uh, very high in protein. It's uh, all the Italians and the Spanish and the French. And now the Irish are eating. Until recently, Pat, known here as Paddy Jack, thought he was a bit of a trendsetter the only man in Ireland serving horse meat. Yeah, well, see, I thought I was the first to, to do horse in Dublin, but it, I didn't realise they were all eating it anyway. <laughs> Just without knowing it. Yeah. In January, the Irish found they had been eating horse meat, labelled beef, in their supermarket frozen food. Cheers, thanks a lot. How much that? Six. Many Europeans don't think there's anything wrong with eating horse meat, as long as they're not told it's something else. It's low in fat, high in iron, and cheaper than beef or pork. Is it good meat to eat? It's lovely meat, yeah. You can have a taste yourself. I'm going to put a bit of salt on it. In places like France and Belgium, horse meat is considered a delicacy. Yeah. That's the back end of the horse now. Oh, the front end of the horse is a bit tougher, you know. Mm -hmm. mm. It's very good. Yeah. Normally, Pat only sells to foreigners. But since the scandal broke, his trade has actually increased. What is that? Horse. Beef. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you can't say that. <laughs> Adventurous Dubliners have been curious to find what the fuss is about. It's nice. The flavour of the char grill is very nice. Yeah. It's nice and lean. Yeah. But for others, eating Ireland's favourite animal is little short of a sin. Millions love to pet them, punt on them, even hunt on them. The Irish love their horses. The Irish, you know, don't want, um, I mean, we don't want to eat horses, <laughs> even though that may be in the news at the moment. The, the horses is, you know, loved by all in Ireland, really, I know. We do, we do, we do love our horses and we use them. But the story we'll tell tonight isn't simply one about a horse-loving nation being duped at the dinner table. It's far more disturbing. We'll reveal a wholesale, systematic criminal harvest of thousands upon thousands of horses. They were spirited into a black market that stretches well beyond these borders and will show the appalling treatment of the doomed animals that fueled much of this substitution scandal. It's a story told with hidden cameras and startling discoveries in the science lab. We found one product with about one third horse DNA in it, and which was just you know, a, a, an incredible finding. The fraud was only found when Ireland's Food Safety Authority did some random tests. We looked at a whole range of different products. Those products that consumers wouldn't quite know what they're buying. Things like products that are covered in pastry, products with something like a potato topping on it, and also beef burgers because the, 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 the meat is, is minced. You've no idea really what's in a beef burger. You have to rely on the supplier you know, to, you know, to, to sell you a beef burger instead of selling you something else. In fact, we didn't believe the finding initially um, because when we started to see traces of horse meat in beef burgers, we went back and checked, we double checked and we treble checked um, because we understood that if we were to go out public with such a story, it was going to have you know, quite an effect, certainly here in Ireland. The shockwaves spread far wider. Supermarket chains across Europe had to withdraw big brand products from Findus to Birdseye.
IKEA found horse meat in its meatballs. Burger King says it stopped it just before it reached its burgers. At the time, we thought it was an Irish problem. It turned out to be a European problem now, in fact, nearly a global problem. There's over 26 countries in Europe who are now involved in this scandal, and products have been withdrawn from shelves in places like Singapore, Hong Kong, in some of the Caribbean countries. Uh, so really, we, we are looking at what really has developed into a massive fraud. The horse meat scandal has raised some disturbing questions about how confident we can be in what we eat. But here in Ireland, it's also exposed some uncomfortable home truths. Ireland isn't just a victim of this scandal, it helped create it. Look around the Irish countryside and it seems like an equine paradise, with horses roaming free across the land. But two years ago, over the border in Northern Ireland, one man sensed something was terribly wrong. Horses were disappearing en masse. Stephen Philpot heads the Ulster Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. This was thousands, thousands of horses. Um, we've just driven past a field here. You know, four years ago there were 38 horses in that field and they disappeared overnight. Once that got onto our radar, we, we, we made it our business to find out what was, what was happening to these Irish horses. He and his colleagues began to video what they thought was strange behaviour. Horses that appeared to have little worth were being collected in fields, loaded into trucks and driven off. There was a huge systematic hoovering up of horses going on. Five years ago, horses like that were everywhere in Ireland. I mean, they were on the sides of roads, they were in fields, they were, they were all over Ireland. Those animals systematically started to disappear. And what we're trying to show here is that, you know, that's how, that's how quickly the whole thing happens. It was all an unexpected consequence of the global financial crisis. Early last decade, Ireland experienced a brief debt fueled economic boom. Come on, lads, win our each way! There was a frenzy of construction, and newly cashed up builders knew exactly how to celebrate. Almost overnight, everyone wanted his very own horse. Racing syndicates boomed, so did horse breeding. Nobody worried about the cost of housing, feeding, medicating and training them. There was a lot of people involved in syndicates who just had, had money like, and uh, it became a, a prestige thing, you know, to get involved in horses and they thought like that this is great. Ten euro on number six inside shadow. Thank you. John Seary was one of the multitudes who bought into a syndicate and one of the few who've stuck it out. When the economy crashed in 2007, the first thing to go was horses. A lot of them horses were put down, I suppose, you know, and they were sold off, a lot of them were sold off to England, a lot of them went to, you know, they were left with trainers, trainers were left with maybe a load of horses on their hands, people just walked away, you know. And he's horrified to think they may have ended up on his dinner plate. Oh, when they were eating the horses, oh. Oh, it was terrible, really. It, you know, we, you know that, that, when we heard this, it really puts, you know, a damper on everything. We saw some very bizarre behaviour. We couldn't give an animal away, yet people were falling over themselves, certain individuals were falling over themselves at the seal yards to acquire the same animals that we couldn't give away. Back in Northern Ireland, the USPCA was growing even more suspicious about horses disappearing. It began visiting sale yards where, despite the glut of horses, a handful of the same people were buying up big. Now, to us, 
That just did not make any commercial sense whatsoever. You would need to have been in the whole horsey world to actually understand what, what was actually going on. What was going on was a massive criminal conspiracy to substitute cheaper horse meat for beef and foist it onto unsuspecting consumers. It's 92 number one, Bailey Ann. Every day, Irish racehorses and show jumpers are legally exported to Britain and France without any need for inspection. But if they're being sent for slaughter, the transporters have to show horse passports. It has pages for inserting any medication that might be given to the horse, relevant medication, a lot of medication that doesn't have to be recorded. But there are those pages, and there are certain pages that are specifically to allow a vet or the owner of the horse to record whether or not the animal is intended for slaughter for human consumption. The idea is to keep dangerous drugs and diseases out of the human food chain. Many racehorses, for example, are given anti-inflammatory drugs like bute that are harmful to humans. To ensure passports aren't switched, horses born since 2009 are injected with microchips to record their identities. It sounds fine in theory, but the rules have been enforced so lightly you could literally drive a truck through them. There are many horses transported between the states that are going to go for slaughter, but they're not declared as going for slaughter. And so horse transporters will, will travel on the ferry in lorries, uh, perhaps uh, in the nighttime sailings, perhaps when they, they expect there aren't inspectors present, and they expect that if they are challenged, they can present a number of passports. So there are 10 horses on the lorry and they can present 10 passports. And they may have an expectation that the horses won't be specifically checked, cross-referenced to the documents. So what you're saying is that it hasn't been hard to beat the system. I, I think that's a fair comment. The reason for beating the system is money. If you can pass off cheap horses as fit for eating, then a lorry load that cost a thousand euros can be sold for four thousand. And it's been happening with ease on a massive scale, as the animal rights activist Stephen Philpot learned when he made contact with one of the smugglers. When the USPCA developed their own source from within inside this criminal conspiracy, it became very apparent from him that in a, over a three-year period, he'd never been stopped once, he'd never been checked on a boat, he'd never had his passports checked, uh, and he told us that on many occasions, um, all was ever done was a head count at the abattoir. No one ever checked the individual passports for the horses, and we believe him. Well, look, thank you very much for, for coming along and talking to us. We really appreciate it. The informant goes by the code name of Greengrass. He's now in fear of his life. So to protect his identity, we've used an actor's voice. Some horses had passports. Any horses that needed passports, there was duplicate passports or whatever you want to call them. Homemade passports sitting there to do the job. Right, you just forge passports for the horses. Or make them up. Did anyone ever check these passports? Never. 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 The whole time you were doing this, you were never stopped by officials? Never. Not at the boat, anyhow. That's extraordinary. Uh, yeah, we're just passing the farm on the left and the right hand side. The USPCA now began a full scale surveillance operation of horse laden lorries. There's lights on at the factory. Well, this is just one example you're looking at. I mean, this happened time and time again. Um, during the night, we'd pick up horse uh, lorries on the move, stuffed full of horses, uh, and we'd stay with them until eventually they would take us, in this instance, to an abattoir in the Republic of Ireland. You're now in the dead of night, uh, and as if by magic, out of the darkness, you'll see vehicle after vehicle starting to appear, stuffed full 
of valueless Irish horses. All the horses are gone, which were brought in last night. There's no horses left. Next morning, when we got back there, it was as if it had never happened. Abattoir was locked up, there were no horses there. All that was left was their hooves and their heads and their guts, and the horse meat had gone. So that is when we worked out what was actually happening. This was all to do with horse meat. Uh, these animals were being spirited away in the middle of the night, and uh, the reason for that was their meat. Okay, vehicle now going uh, general direction of uh, Olma. The informant Greengrass helped transport thousands of horses out of Belfast port to abattoirs in England. Officials barely glanced at the consignments. He says some horses were so weak, they were dosed with cortisone and bute before they were loaded. Otherwise, they wouldn't survive the journey. Just how bad were some of the horses? On a scale of one to 10, maybe three. Really, so very poor condition. Yeah. So was there any horse you wouldn't take? No, if it could walk up the ramp, if you could get it up the ramp, it would be on. This is one of the English abattoirs he says he brought them to. What you're about to see is upsetting. An animal rights group secretly filmed slaughtermen committing acts of sickening cruelty. As many as three horses at a time were forced into the holding pen for shooting. But you're not allowed to do that. You're certainly not allowed to kill animals in the presence of another animal. Uh, the animal is dead, is supposed to be dead and not moving by the time it goes up on those foot jackals. It's still alive. The informant Greengrass says the abattoirs knew exactly what they were getting. Did you ever see any officials at the abattoirs? Never. Never? No. Did that surprise you? Yeah. So all the abattoirs are saying they had no idea that they were using meat that shouldn't be used for human consumption. What do you say to that? They knew. In this scandal, nobody's accepting blame. Not the supermarkets, the frozen food companies, nor their suppliers. But the illicit meat was allowed to pass through every link in the food chain. This financial scam was based on the conversion of a valueless Irish horse with fraudulent passport was being converted into a, a sought after delicacy on the, on the continent of Europe, uh, i.e. horse meat. And the problem that started the whole mess Unwanted, abandoned horses continues. Well, this is the kind of depressing sight you see around Dublin these days. This was going to be a housing estate before the recession killed the building industry. So now it's just vacant land and lots of people have simply abandoned their horses here. Hardly any grass after a long winter, so a lot of the horses are hungry and sick and Horses here are dead. You see dead horses just lying in the field right beside the motorway. I can go in and get her, Caroline, if you want. Because she's so nervous. Yeah, she's terrified. Oh, you're so Hilary Robinson runs a small rescue charity called Hungry Horse Outside. Been around with her. Just this morning we picked her up. She was um, left on the side of the road. She's no microchip in her. We checked. She's she's not too poor, but she's very very frightened. So she is. Oh, oh, as you can see, by her poor little girl. A bit, yeah. And she's full of these old sticky backs, and she doesn't look too well, love. Now, good girl. She says she's shocked by Ireland's failure to enforce the rules. One of the horses she rescued, named Charlie, is living proof of that. But before I loaded him onto the horse box, I decided I'd scan him to see if he had a microchip. Never thought he would have. And he did, so on the Monday then I went, drank the department, but they said data protection, they couldn't give me out any information about his owner or anything like that. But they could tell me it was Sport Horse Ireland, it's a passport agency. 
So um, I rang them and they said, oh yeah, we have his passport, but uh, he was slaughtered back in March 2012. I, know, I now know it was the 24th of March. So um, according to his passport, he's, he's dead? He's dead, <laughs> yes, and on the third day he rose again. Hey Charlie. The likely explanation is that someone used Charlie's passport to get another horse slaughtered for meat. What does that tell you about the passport system? It's very, very poor. Very poor. We've always known it was poor, but mm -hmm. not to this extent. Not to the extent that somebody in Charlie's place went down the slaughter line for food. The good news is that the Food Safety Authority hasn't found dangerous chemicals in the processed meats it's tested. But that doesn't lessen the fraud on consumers. Well, it's difficult to spe speculate on exactly you know, how long this, this scam has been going on. But what we do know is that manufacturers have been drip feeding horse meat into the food chain and they've been doing that at the expense of the consumer. It's a blatant fraud, you know, as well as that fair, fair trading practices, you know, really have to be questioned. Uh, because if you are bidding for, let's say, a contract for, you know, manufacturing certain beef products and you're undercutting your competitors and knowingly adding horse meat instead of beef, I mean, say, that, that, that is going to impact hugely on uh, industry. And it's something that we have to stamp out uh, very quickly because what you will have here is a race to the bottom and that's really not where we want to go. In Dublin now, supermarkets aren't promoting cheap processed food. It's all about being natural and homegrown. Regulations are being toughened up and the passport system tightened. Everything we looked but to Stephen Philpot, it's all happening after the proverbial horse has bolted. In one fell swoop, we have neglected an entire species of animal and we really all, as, as welfareists, uh, as a developed country, we should all be ashamed of that. Nobody cared. And that's the bottom line in this whole story. Nobody cared. Nobody bothered asking the question we asked. Where are all the Irish horses going? In the situation that the Irish economy found itself in 2007, we loved money more. Money was more loved than the horses. But sometimes the two can be combined. Today, Paddy Jack, the only man in Ireland to openly serve horse, has come to race one. So you brought him to, to basically <laughs> sell his horse meat? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then what happened? It's just we were coming home along the road and we had his book, you know, and his book was, uh, is a very, he was, had a very good breed pedigree on it. We were going to kill him and then we changed our mind. My daughter said that we'd give him a chance and it's either left. So instead of becoming a horse meat sandwich, he's, uh, he's a racehorse again? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what's his name? Uh, do or die, so. Oh. <laughs> do or die. Yeah. <laughs> And so, without realising the inherent threat in his name, Do or Die was given a second chance. So racing up there to pass the first, there's two circuits and ten fences ahead of him. And the name who leads is on the right side. As Ireland comes to terms with the failures of the past, there's hope the future will be brighter for its horses. Stuart Dice Sullivan has relegated Glam Moore to be the back marker. Fight from home, good jump by Fene at that one. Walk and talk. The future for Do or Die may be slightly more problematic. In this, his first race, he was nearly last. Is it horse burgers for Do or Die? No, 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 we, we he had a big day. Lucky for him, the Irish still love their horses.